Welcome to the Digital Agency Growth Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Englander. David, great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, for sure. And I love having people like yourself on that have started agencies that have lasted decades now, right? So it sounds like if I have it right, you started Now Speed in 2003? Yeah, that's right. So we've been doing this for 20 years. So it's been uh, quite a ride. Yeah, I can imagine. So I guess to start things out, can you talk a little bit about your background and what made you want to do something crazy like start an agency in 2003? Sure. Well, I actually started my first agency in 1994. So we started at the beginning of the commercial internet. We had this crazy idea that people would want to buy computers online and started started this company called Online Computer Market back in 94. And we quickly found out that people really didn't want to sell computers online. We went to computer companies and said, hey, how about we sell for you online? They said, that's the craziest thing we've ever heard of. But how about if you build us a website? So we quickly pivoted to being a website design development company. I grew that company up and then I sold it in 1998 and then started this company in 2003. So I was uh, with the, uh, the acquiring company for a while and then I started this company. So I'm doing uh, digital marketing, web design, advertising for a long time and had a lot of experiences. Yeah, I can imagine. And there's there's just so many trends that must have come and gone in that amount of time. So to hopefully bring this to a question. So you had this boom of the internet being a new thing and everybody needing a website and not that many people knew how to make sites. And then over time, more companies learned how to. You, I guess to, to talk a little, like, I know it's been a while now, but kind of going back to the late nineties, what was that like back then? Like, could you see the writing on the wall that web design could become more commoditized soon? Or was it just an opportunity? Like how did, how did that sale come about, if you don't mind me asking? Well, I mean, we saw lots of evolution in uh, in the technology and what was required to build a website. So at the beginning, you know, we were building websites with uh, Notepad and it was all manual. We were hiring software engineers to build websites and it was very technical and we were very manual. And so over time, more and more tools, more and more technologies came about and it became easier and easier to build websites. That said, where our market was, was still building websites for medium to large companies. And so they were still big projects that we're selling back in the 90s. What I couldn't have foreseen when I sold the company in 98 and, you know, had the earn out and kind of worked through that was the crash in 2000. So, you know, if we hadn't sold when we did, it could have been disastrous, right? Or we might have survived it, who knows? But um, the crash was when a lot of tech funding kind of dried up and a lot of agencies went out of business during that period of time. So I managed to get through all that and then started my next company after that period, really in 2003. And, and by that time, the market had changed really dramatically. So tools and technologies had come along to make it a lot easier to build websites. And we really focused more on email marketing, advertising, SEO, and then eventually social media as marketing services rather than website design services. So, so now speeds a marketing agency, a digital ad agency that also does website design rather than my first company, which was a web development company, very different business. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So I guess kind of going back to 2003, like what, what was your kind of vision for an agency back then and how that changed? Is, it, is there still a grain of what you had in mind back then or is it something completely different? Yeah, you know, when I started in 2003, I'd come off the sale. I was, I was coming off of that whole period and I really wanted to just get back in the market and start a lifestyle business. I really just, the goal wasn't really to grow. The goal was just to have a few clients, do some great work. And um, hired our first employee like a year in. You know, it was a very slow growth kind of process, and it was a it was many years later, probably more than a dozen years later, that I decided to start growing the business and adding employees. and And then actually, the last few years, we've acquired several other agencies, and that's been exciting. I love the challenge of uh, leading leaders in our in our management team. I love the challenge of creating package services rather than just being more of an individual consultant and creating service offerings that people can buy and uh, use successfully. I love you know, creating systems and process. So it, it suits my personality. Maybe it's the engineering part of my brain that likes building the systems and process that help the company be successful. So it's, yeah, it's trained, changed so dramatically over the last 20 years. Yeah, that's interesting. And I, I think I started my business, you know, sales schema kind of as a lifestyle business as well, because I had read four hour work week, and I was coming off fresh from that. And then, you know, there, there came a period of time when I remember being on sales calls in Rio in Brazil during Carnival, nobody else is there. Internet's bad. I'm sweating. And I'm like, 
I came down here for lifestyle and I'm just sort of working. And it was this real like cognitive dissonance <laughs> moment. And then since then, I wouldn't say there's one thing that stands out, but it's it was a process to kind of transition to like, you know, there's there's meaning and building something bigger and so on and so forth. But with that, can, can you talk about that that progression a little bit? You know, what changed? How did, how did things go from, you know, year one to year 12? And how did you decide to start building it up again? Yeah, well, those early years, we were really selling based on networking and relationships. And so one of the things that changed is really getting into more professional marketing. We were a marketing agency, but trying to drive our own leads and build a deeper network of referral partners. That was really important to us. And then, you know, moving from just getting in and doing the work to doing package services, defining clearly what service level means to every client rather than just selling a bunch of hours to do stuff that the client might want us to do. So, you know, creating package services around SEO, pay-per-click, website design development, and then adding people. As you add people, then you have to train each of them on what those services are, what the client gets, and then trust that they're going to deliver great work on your behalf. Because as as the owner, you're still responsible for all the delivery, but you're not really delivering all the delivery. So it can be stressful if you don't have the good people and good process and good training systems to make sure that that's all being delivered well. So over the years, we've had amazing employees and not so amazing employees. And so it's, uh, I think right now we're very fortunate to have an amazing, wonderful team, but over the years, it's been up and down. So got to get through it. So being a survivor is very important to me. And I'm glad that I've survived so far. Yeah, that's great. And uh, one thing that I often ask agency owners that have been around the block for a little while <laughs> is like, what did it feel like? Were the, did it feel like there were different phases or different milestones? Would you say that, hey, five employees was one thing you think about versus 10 versus 30? Or how do you kind of like divide up those periods in your mind in terms of like what it felt like running the agency? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that the first level is really like, uh, let's say zero to three, you know, like where you're, you're deciding to have an employees at all, right? So it's really, you know, you're doing all the work, you're selling, you're delivering, you're kind of a, a contractor, but maybe you have a, a partner or two, right? And then the next level is where you decide to have real employees and a real service. And that's really where, let's say you're, you know, three to eight, three to 10 employees. And that's where let's call that model is, I often see it where an agency owner, it's really the owner and their assistants. You know, you don't want to hire too, somebody too expensive. You want to hire junior people because they're affordable. And you want to have your finger on the pulse of everything. You feel like the client is really buying you. They're not really buying a service. So you have to touch every piece of work. You have to touch every client. You have to be involved in every sale. And then that level is really you and all the assistants, right? And that can work really well. And I think it's a big leap when an agency owner goes from that level to the next level, which is hiring managers or directors to lead those people where you start. And that's really, let's, let's call that the eight to 20 people, right? Level. And that's where you start to say, you know, I'm not going to touch every sale. I'm not going to touch every client deliverable. I'm not even going to know about every client that I've got. I've got to have people that I trust to do all that. And so then you've got to, you know, you've got to be able to delegate and trust and you've got to be leading leaders rather than selling clients and delivering client work. So that's a huge step. And then the next step, which is really where we're at now, is really when you're leading directors. That's kind of, we're a small company, we're just about 30 people, but I'm focused on, you know, strategy and leadership and process and systems and holding people accountable rather than focused on selling or quality or any deliverables. So I'm focused on building the business rather than working, the, the classic working on the business, working for the business. I'm still working for the business, but I'm just working on more strategic things right now. Yeah, that's great. And thanks for, for kind of going through that. And to kind of focus the question a little bit, because I want to talk about hiring, training, you know, building the team and everything. But to, to focus that, that big leap period, because that's where I think a lot of our listeners are, that going, whatever the numbers are, three to 10 from eight to 20, et cetera. What did you learn about that process? And specifically, what do you kind of wish you knew then that you know now when it comes to hiring and training and going from kind of crossing that chasm, hiring managers, hiring leaders, and that sort of thing? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that, that is a very difficult period. Uh, you know, for me, it was many times 
one step forward, two steps back, sometimes two steps forward, one step back. So you, at least I, vacillated between hiring people that were very expensive and not really what the agency needed, and then kind of finding out that they weren't a good fit to hiring people that were too junior and couldn't take the agency to where we needed to go. So I think the challenge is really finding the right people for where you are at the time. Let's say, you know, you're 10 people and you really want to grow to 20 people and you find this amazing woman who's, let's call her Sally, and she's just come out of Omicron and she was like a account director for Coca-Cola and she's got amazing stuff and you hire her, she may not be the right person to help you go from 10 to 15 people. She might be, you know, too senior and thinking too big, but, or she might be, she might be able to land the next amazing account and help you grow. But it's those kind of decisions that are very difficult, hiring the right team and growing at the right level. The other part is really defining your service offerings. Often when you're very young, you're kind of doing your all things to all people, or you're highly specialized, but you, you have to decide really what you want to be great at and be very good in, and make sure that you hire the right people to be great and deliver the services that you can really make money at doing. So both of those challenges are are difficult. And I think often it uh, takes a lot of resilience as an owner to kind of get through those. Often, again, it's, you know, one step forward, two steps back, you learn, you survive, you learn again, you, you, you keep trying and eventually figure it out. Yeah, that makes sense. And I want to shift to the service and packaging things in a second, but just talk a little bit more about hiring and training and, and so on. One lesson that I've that I've experienced myself that's obviously out there in the zeitgeist is when you hire somebody good, they tend to be motivated right out of the gate and then they might have a dip and then you have to get through the dip with them and they're back up again. But it's very rare to hire somebody in my experience and their performance is bad at the beginning and then they recover later. Whether or not you agree with that, is there is there anything like that that you've picked up on kind of hiring leaders, like any commonalities or red flags that could be negative in your experience? Yeah, I, I've made a lot of hiring mistakes. I've also been very fortunate with great hires. So one of the things I've learned is that I'm not a great hiring manager. So as the leader, I, I tend to hire, I tend to get really excited about people. I tend to believe everything they say. I tend to be very optimistic about people. I tend to say, hey, you took a marketing course in college. Of course, you can manage this $30 million campaign. I think I could figure it out. You could figure it out. Of course you could do that. And so I tend to be really optimistic. And what I learned early on is that I needed to let go of the hiring process and get the other team members in my company involved. And so we moved to from Dave is recruiting, hiring, and uh, you know, making those hiring decisions too. It's really a team. And maybe Dave gets to make the final decision, but maybe not. Maybe I need to completely let go of that and really let the team who's trying to find and build the expertise and has to work with the people all day long, they need to find those the, the best people. So that was a big aha uh -huh that probably improved our company more than anything was getting me out of the hiring process and letting the team work together to hire the best people. Yeah, I was I was just nodding my head because I've I've been there as well. And then it's funny when you get other people involved, just the things that people will pick up on in an interview that you won't. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, it's just it's, it's it's kind of fascinating. It's like, huh, I didn't even notice that. I didn't even notice they answered this question in this positive or negative way or whatever it is. So that's interesting. Um, let's face it. Building proposals is a pain for most agencies. It drains your time and energy, and the fear of putting in all that effort only to be ghosted by prospects is real. But what if I told you there's a better way? Introducing Smart Pricing Table, the game-changing interactive proposal software designed specifically for agencies like yours. Developed by a former agency owner, their powerful tool cuts down on the back and forth, incorporates upsells seamlessly, and lets you build proposals at lightning speed. No more grinding it out and leaving money on the table. It's time to create a repeatable system where your prospects can upsell themselves. Learn more at smartpricingtable.com slash DAG and schedule a demo today. And, and to shift gears a little bit, so I think the topic of productizing agency services is very popular right now and understandably. And I think we're in this period where the lines are getting blurry between agency and e-learning and these productized online services and other things like that. But can you talk about that a little bit when you talk about the like packaging services and how it sounds like that was a big growth driver for you? What did it take to do that? What lessons did you learn? And what was the sort of evolution of how you how you guys package services? Yeah, that was a that was very important for us. And I 
because I'd had another agency, you know, in the nineties, I was really thinking about that, you know, from day one. So what are the package services? And that, that's so important. I mean, that's often it's the evolution from being a, you know, an hourly consultant. Are you just hired as the email marketing contractor or are you selling an email marketing service? There's a total huge difference in that. And one of the big differences is the owner, most owners of small companies, especially when they're younger, think that the client is buying them. And it's a little bit of an ego thing, right? Oh, they're buying, they're buying me. You know, that's really good because I'm smart and I sold it and I'm, they want me in every meeting. They want me to be, you know, involved in every deliverable. And you can't grow your business at all. You can't grow if you have that attitude. You, you're, you're stuck You because you only have so much time. And so if you're doing it all, then you're not really selling service, you're selling the people. So what you have to do is you have to transition to a, clear set of deliverables that are, that are what the market wants. They ask, you can't just, you have to make sure that's what, what the client really wants, but you got to move from being the email marketing consultant to selling an email marketing service. You get three emails a month. We're going to do the template. We're going to do the design. We're going to write them. They're going to be this many words. You're going to approve it in this. You get so many revision cycles. We're going to send it out through this platform. You're going to approve it here. You're not going to approve it here. You're going to have to define all of that in detail and then price it at a certain price. You could do it hourly or you could do it at a fixed price, different pricing models, but you have to define what the client gets. And that way, the client signs on to that. Then they're not buying you. They're buying the service. And then you can hire other people who are experts at that to deliver it. And then it allows you to grow and get out of individual delivery so that you can go to Rio and you can go on vacation. Because if you're not, if you're responsible for every deliverable and every service because they're buying you, then there's no way to ever let go and you'll drive yourself crazy. Right. And were there any uh were there any experiments you had to run to figure out the optimal way to to form these packages? And what, what did those look like? Because I think one challenge with the agency or any you know major B2B service is just kind of lack of data, you know, because it's not like consumer where you have this fire hose of data all the time. You have a lot of different situations. They're, you know, they're not quite exactly the same. Maybe it's a different vertical, different type of buyer. So love to hear your experience with that, if that question makes sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So I think you can create services based on your expertise and knowledge, but it's really helpful to look at what your competitors are doing. I mean, in in our market, right, in digital advertising, we have thousands of competitors, tens of thousands of competitors, right? So it's just a massive, massive competitive group. So if you were doing digital advertising, Dan, and you're, you know, you're really good at it, and I was doing it, we could learn from each other, but the odds of us being direct competitors on any particular deal are almost zero because there's just so much out there. So I think as an owner, you should really be looking at what your competitors are doing, understand, well, you know what they're all about. Uh, I had a recent aha in one of our services around SEO. So I was looking at, you know, our SEO service and we're very good at it. We've sold it for a long time. We've been doing SEO for probably 18 of our 20 years. And we've been doing it kind of the same way all of this time. And, you know, over the last year, I've looked at what our competitors are doing. I've looked at the market and we've just reinvented the SEO service with AI enabled content. And we've exponentially grown the amount of content that we can deliver through our SEO service. And so that's helped us. And, you know, part, part of that is looking at what's possible through AI tools. And part of that's happening through looking at what competitors are doing. But we've really taken that service and essentially we've tripled the price, but probably taken the value up by 10x to our clients. So it's, you know, it's a case where you can get really comfortable just doing the same thing over and over again for a long time to the same kind of service. But it's so helpful to look at the package services that other competitors are doing and then figure out really what's possible in the market and think wider about, uh, about the services that you can deliver. Yeah, that, that's great. And to, to do a little sidebar on that, can you talk a little bit about your process for doing competitive analysis? Because I think there's a lot of times there's a tendency to just be like, these people are doing this over there, you know, let's emulate that and see see if it works. But you don't really know because it's just the outside looking in, like you're seeing the the paint on the car, but the engine might be corroded or there could be something you, you're doing better or whatever. So can you talk about how do you take what's valuable from that and leave the rest. Yeah, that's a really good point. So it's, uh, it is hard to look at competitors websites and understand what they're even doing, because everybody says they're doing everything. And you know, it's hard to figure out what they're really doing. What I've discovered is that a lot of agencies say they're doing everything, and they're really outsourcing half of it. 
you know, or three quarters of it or 90% of it where, you know, it looks like they've got an amazing agency and there's really one gal and she's outsourcing like 90% of what she's doing. Mm -hmm. So I think that that it can be deceptive and you shouldn't necessarily trust everything that's said on every website. You know, at NowSpeed, we do probably 98% of the work through internal employees. So everything that's on our website, we're doing through employees that are, you know, on our staff. So it gives us a lot of control, got a lot of ability to, to make, to drive really high quality through uh, through our services. So, you know, it's, um, there's, you know, there's different ways to do delivery. I'm not saying that's a terrible model, but ter in terms of competitive research, the other, one thing I've done a lot more recently is just talk to other agency owners. Most agency owners are willing to share what they're doing, especially if they're not in the same geographic market, or maybe they're not in the same service offerings. You can learn a lot if you're a digital you know, ad agency, talk to a PR agency. How do they price? How do they staff? How do they deliver? How do they package their services? You might not be competitors at all, but you can learn a huge amount from uh, for what they're doing. So I've also you know, had, it's an interesting, had uh, companies uh, try to acquire NowSpeed. You probably, we all get these calls every day. Hey, I'd, I'd like to buy your company, right? It's a, I would call it a scam. It's just part of how the industry works. There's a whole bunch of people that are trying to make money by consolidating all these agencies. But by talking to other agency owners that are trying to acquire you, you learn a lot about what they're doing. Maybe it's a company that's three, four, five times as big as you are, but you can learn about what they've done what their methodology is, maybe they're one or five years ahead of you in your evolution. And so that's been a great resource for me to learn what I should be doing better by talking to people who want to acquire me, frankly. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And it sounds like it's, it gives you this broader kind of contextual understanding of what's going on out there. And I think kind of tied to that is, is I know you've, you've written a book, uh, Digital Marketing in the Zone, if I have that right. Can you talk about that a little bit? Like, what did it take to develop that methodology? How would you describe it? And how useful has the book been? And where, where do you use it? Sure. Yeah. Digital Marketing in the Zone was a labor of love. I spent actually about five years on it. I really wanted to take our methodology and just uh, codify it. So put it into a package. The goal for it was really to make us look like experts and uh, and to give us a branding advantage. So we use it in pre-sale. We always talk about the book as a, as a differentiator. We deliver it to prospects or customers uh, when they want or they want to request it. So it's been a really good marketing tool, kind of a door opener. There's a lot of marketing books out there, so I had no illusions this was going to be some kind of a bestseller, but it's been a good door opener and credibility builder for us. Yeah, that's great. And uh, can you talk about a couple of points from the book? Like, is there anything where you're sort of poking the bear or going against conventional marketing methodology? Well, I'd say it's uh, it's pretty comprehensive. So it's really, you know, strategy from strategy to um, data and analytics to, you know, website design, marketing systems and methodologies. So it's really kind of takes an overall view of all those things. So I would say, so it's so funny right now I'm reading, I don't have it right here. I'm reading uh, Start With Why by Simon Sinek. And that that kind of book is totally the opposite, right? It's like one big idea and it kind of talks about big brands and and that's uh, that's different. My book is much more a step-by-step -step how to methodology for digital marketing. It's really a more of a embodiment of our methodology that I've gone through. So, you know, it's been good. So someday maybe I'll write a more controversial book, but uh, that's good. Part of the process of writing the book, which was good for me, was actually writing the book. So kind of the discipline of getting up. I took one month and I uh, decided to write. There's a this crazy thing, um, and I won't digress into it, but I... I, I took a month and I decided to write at least uh, 1,667 words a day. In, Ambitious. Uh, exactly. And yeah. so if you do, that's that's a formula that says, if I do that for 30 days, I come up with 50,000 words. So it was this one short period of time where I just said, every day I'm going to put like two or three hours in, I'm going to write my 1,667 words and I'm going to get it out there. And so that got me about a third of the way there. And then I took five more years to polish it, and <laughs> put it into a form that was actually readable. So yeah, yeah, that, that's the hard part. And I think, I think you make a good point, like with business books or most nonfiction, there's either like one of two ways. It's either the handbook manual, or it's the one big idea. And then the rest of the book just has examples proving why this is true, you know? So 
I think I think there's a lot to be said for that. And one thing to shift gears a little bit to hop around. One thing that you said earlier, which was interesting, is that it sounded like when you started the agency, there was a big focus on driving your own leads, which isn't always the case for lots of agencies, even ones that have been relatively successful, you know, working with clients that are often very reactive and sort of like relying on referrals and they have a lot of trouble building repeatable new business processes. So can you talk about that a little bit? What did it take to get there? What channels were you using? And yeah, what what was that journey like? Or how was that journey going? (laughs) Sure. So in the early days, it was really, you know, networking and referral based. So I got my first client because I was going to this church at the time. And I knew a guy and he's working at this tech company. He was in marketing. We started talking and he brought me in and we got a contract, you know, and that was our first contract. And then he referred me to another guy and then we started with him. So it's really this, you know, one step and the clients introduce you to other con- clients. So it's really networking, referral based that starts. And I think that's the way most agencies start is uh, you continue to do that. But that that only takes you so far. And so what I've decided to do really, and I've spent a lot of time over this the last five years is build, you know, essentially eat our own dog food and build a integrated digital marketing function that drives leads from a wide variety of sources. So right now we we invest a ton of time and effort in creating content for SEO that drives organic traffic and drives leads. So we're kind of getting good results from that. We run digital ads, you know, on LinkedIn and Google to drive those raw leads. I do a lot of networking through my podcast and through conversations like this with people. So networking and uh, relationships and referrals are still very important for us, but they're more systematic and planned and structured than they used to be. So using all those sources, and of course, you know, clients introduces to other clients and all of that's still good. But, you know, in my experience, it's not one thing that drives leads. Leads come to us every day from a wide variety of sources. So last month we had probably more than half our leads were through pay-per-click and that was awesome, but that's unusual. So often it's referrals come and you know, at, at agencies of our size, it doesn't take that many really high quality new clients to make a huge difference. And um, we work with partners, get referrals. It's all sources all the time. Yeah, that makes sense. And to shift from staying within new business, but to shift from kind of the what to the who, I think one thing uh, a lot of a lot of agency owners struggle with is removing themselves from the sales seat. And uh, some never do. But can you talk about that a little bit? Is there quote unquote sales team in the organization? Is it just you or do you have help or how does, how, what does, what does that look like? Yeah, we do have a sales team. So we have, we have two salespeople and we have other directors who are uh, working on sales, uh, up sales to existing clients. In that sales model, it's much more organic and relationship and problem solving and analytical based. So we get a client and we we go deep into their needs, you know, maybe they were doing advertising and we do an SEO analysis and their challenges. And so we do a proposal and we can do upsell, but it's not quite the same hardcore sales, more like a, a relationship sell. For the for uh, new leads that are coming in, yeah, we have two um, salespeople that follow up on all new leads and that works really well. So they're excellent. They're well-trained. They're knowledgeable. I think the key there that I've learned over time is that it takes a long time to develop a new salesperson. I've made tons of mistakes in hiring salespeople. And it's easy to get discouraged when you bring in a new salesperson, they don't generate their own leads, they don't sell anything for the first three months, and then you fire them. And then you try somebody else. And I've gone through that period, that cycle many times. And it took me a long time to get to a point where I've got good people that I'm investing in that I trust through the good times, the bad times, sometimes they're hot and things are going well, sometimes they're not. But I also, I should say, one of our core values is extreme ownership. So when salespeople aren't selling, I look back and I say, well, what what do I own in this process? Because I'm responsible for lead generation in our company. So is it the quality of the leads? Is it the training? Is it the product? Is it the pricing? Do I blame them because it's not working or do I take ownership and you know, on my better days, I take ownership and I focus on fixing all the things to help them be successful rather than blaming them because they didn't get the lead or close the sale or something like that. Yeah. And I think that's the right way to think about it. And we've, we've talked with lots of agencies and I've talked with many agency owners that have said, you know what, it doesn't work for us to hire a salesperson. I have to be the one to do it. Uh, we've hired five salespeople and they all failed. And I was like, after the third or fourth, 
maybe there's something else wrong. And I think what we find is that great salespeople that have been successful in an organization are usually in a in a well-established organization where there's leads that they get and there's a structure and there's systems and they plug them into that and they're successful. So oftentimes the agency owner is hiring somebody like that. And then they say, here's a deck or a proposal, send them off onto a nice float and then <laughs> nothing happens. Right. So I think that's the right way to approach it. That takes experience and all. So that's yeah, great. I, uh, on that on that topic, I had a great uh, podcast interview last year in my first series for first season, and uh, the person pointed out that the way that the owner sells is never the the way that the salesperson sells because nobody can sell like the owner. The owner kind of has this sense of trust and experience, and they can make product changes on the fly, and they can customize it, and they can change the pricing, and they can say, "Oh, you, you don't want Bob on this? We'll put Sue on it." There's all kinds of ways to the owner can sell. The salesperson doesn't sell like that at all. They have a standard deck. They get their leads. They It's a very different kind of sell. So you need process and systems and leads to make the salesperson successful. And the owner can't judge the uh, salesperson by the same standards as they use to judge themselves. My close rate is 50%. Your close rate is 25%. You're fired, right? That's a way to waste a lot of money on hiring salespeople. Yeah. And I also think another part of that, the perspective I've gotten is just understanding that there's like a certain cost of doing business to A, them ramping up and, and learning and then B, just accepting that, yeah, you could probably close better, but your your hourly, hourly rate is astronomically higher to do this, right? So that's that's another huge issue. So you're going to, and it's painful, you know, because like, new salespeople will probably blow up some deals you might have been able to win. That's just, that's what's yeah. expensive about it. So exactly. But you'll never be able to scale your business if you have to touch every lead and every sale and every proposal. You rewrite every proposal, you know, you qualify every lead. You'll never be more than, you know, five or 10 people as an agency. So right. and maybe that's okay. Yeah, that's what you want, but you, you know, it's hard to grow. Yeah, exactly. So David, this has been so much fun. I guess the last question is just what what are you working on? Like what gets you up in the morning um, over the next few months? I've been doing this for a long time and we've been doing our, you know, these core service areas around, uh, you know, website design development and SEO and digital advertising. And it's easy to get complacent, like it's the same product. And you know what, this year I've realized that all these services really need to go to the next level. So I'm thinking hard about like, what do I, what do, I do to take our SEO service and release the SEO, let's call it 3.0, that says, you know, what does that mean now this year? SEO, it feels like is going through a massive transformation. Digital advertising, you know, now there's Twitter is now X and Facebook and Instagram and TikTok. And, you know, the acceleration of change in our industry is really exciting for me. You need to take that and package it in back in your service offerings. So that's what I'm working on right now. Taking all this complexity, all this change and rethinking our service offerings to make sure that they're as competitive and as effective as they can be. Yeah. And to do a quick sidebar on that, what's your take on AI? How is it affecting what you're planning that you can talk about now? Yeah, so I'm super excited about AI. It's uh, It helps us be more effective at so many levels. Let's just take content creation. Content used to be really expensive for a clients, and now the cost of actually creating the content is going to almost zero, not completely zero, but like it's going to zero. So that means that clients can finally have all the content they should have had all along because clients need content for all products and services for all markets across the entire buying cycle in all forms necessary. So that's a massive amount of content and they don't most of our clients are, you know, medium sized companies and they don't have anywhere near that kind of content. So that's exciting and that means but that means we have to get a lot better at content strategy and content planning and content production and content leverage than we are now. So I think that that's uh, that's the opportunity for us and for all companies, really. So, you know, thinking about leveraging AI. Now, when AI can do all of that seamlessly, that'll be interesting. I don't think it's there yet, but who knows what'll happen in the next five years. But right now, it it still needs us humans to think through the strategy and the plan and use it effectively. So we still have a job. Yeah, yeah, for now. So that's, that's <laughs> super interesting. And Dave, this has been, this has been great. Uh, where can people go to follow what you're up to or get in touch or any of those things? Sure. The best way to contact me is through uh, nowspeed.com, or you can find me on uh, LinkedIn at uh, just search for David Resky. I'm probably the only one. Awesome. We'll get that linked up. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you.